This is to help you solve problems. I hope you don't have too many, but they do keep cropping up and all the reasons why, and so that you can see more clearly what you can do to help. Sometimes they're not a cause for concern. Sometimes they are. So I'm beginning here with uh, squash plants that I planted all at the same time, five weeks ago on heaps of different compost. I had these, these this is some compost I buy, so I had it delivered. And you can see that squash plants all look quite different for the reasons that I'll explain. So the strongest one here is, is on the edge of a, a heap of uh, green waste compost, actually. But it also, it's rooting into the heap behind it, which is uh, cow manure. So th there's plenty of nutrients. There's no food shortage here. But what's also good about the green waste compost is um, it's quite old. It's a year since I had it delivered. Um, often when, when you buy it, if you buy loads, they, it's hot still. If it's hot and you, you try and use it at that stage, it's not finished compost and the growth is not so good. But this one is good and, and just digging in there, you can see what lovely compost it is. And I'm seeing quite a few plant roots like that. And towards the bottom of this heap, actually, there's quite a few worms as well. <clears throat> so by comparison, the, the absolute opposite extreme is that plant there on top of the heap, which is mushroom compost. And it's not per se to say that the mushroom compost is bad, only that when this mushroom compost arrived, it was hot. And that was six weeks ago, seven weeks, and it was 60 centigrade. I checked it with my thermometer, which is currently reading 30. So the heap is now more or less finished composting. And in fact, there's two plants I put in on the side of the heap. And you can see they're doing much better than the one in the middle, which when people talk about roots getting burnt, <laughs> it doesn't normally mean they're getting cooked by heat. Um, more that the, the composting process, the heat process, or the breakdown process, I should say, is taking nutrients away from plant roots. And that's, to me, that's what's happening there. I don't think that plant is ever going to make a squash. This one certainly will. And you can also see a pretty nice looking plant on the edge of the heap of cow manure. <coughs> so this is, uh, it's actually been milled, oddly enough, but it's, that's basically cow manure and straw, which uh, was hot again when it arrived. So putting it on the edge helped to get away from that. And yeah, I'm, pretty confident seeing that. And there's one other thing I did here, which is um, this potato. I planted here only five days ago, actually, from another heap. I'm using it as a, a check on this horrible weed killer, Amino Pyrolid. You can see a video I put up on that one. It's become quite common and it can occur in heaps of compost at any of these it could be in. And if you grow a potato, and I've also got a tomato growing over there in the mushroom compost for the same reason. They're very susceptible, and you would see inward curling of new leaves um, in the middle of these plants or at the growing tip. And that's the indication, if you see it, <laughs> that the, the poison is in there. And so what I'm seeing here is a lovely, healthy potato plant. The tomato plant's healthy too, so that's reassuring before I spread this compost in the garden. And I'll just show you too that the mushroom compost, it's a little bit, um, you don't see too much by looking at the surface. If you, if I make a little hole, you can see it's pretty nice compost, basically. That's turning into nice compost, but it wasn't as nice as that when it was delivered. And so that's what's causing quite a lot of that yellowing. And you can see also the yellowing here. It's not a virus or, or anything like that. It's just plant struggling, plant weakness, resulting in yellowing leaves. And we can see a very extreme version of that over here on a pile of wood chip. Here we have an extreme example of nutrient deprivation, yellow leaves and poor growth from, in this case, wood. And this is why you don't want wood in the rooting zone. Wood is fine as a surface mulch, which is therefore above where the roots are going down into the ground. That doesn't take away the nutrients when it's on the surface, but if the only place that roots have to 
go is in this case like a pile of wood chippings that I was given back in January. The tree surgeon dropped it here. So that's, we're now June, <clears throat> six months ago roughly. And you can see they're starting to decompose. That sort of um, smoky stuff coming off is more a fungal breakdown. If we, I'm going to chip away actually to see the, the roots of this plant, but you can see how just basically, this, this is the same planting as, as the ones we saw just now, you know. Uh, but it shows how, also when, when they're really deprived of nutrients, um, there's one there that's even flowering, <coughs> desperate to make a fruit and make some seed, because I think it can tell it's not going to be able to grow anymore. Uh, but if we just have a look, and there's it looks like, no, that's not a root actually. Here we go. So you see, it has made some roots. I'm, I'm not expecting anything from this, by the way. I, I put it in here just as a demo, just to see. And it has managed to make some roots. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> but the, the roots can't find goodness because wood, as it decomposes, <clears throat> takes a, needs a lot of nitrogen, which the plant also needs. And they compete basically for that. And the result is the plant loses out. So. That, this, this could be one indication if, if you've somehow got wood in your soil that you would see poorer growth like that. And one other factor which is very interesting too about causing slightly weaker growth in yellowing leaves is over here. Here there's a lot of interesting things going on. And on the topic of yellow leaves, I'm showing you the difference between these squash plant, there's two actually in this bed, and these two. And the difference in soil here is not much. Same compost, same additions, but this bed every year we fork. So this is actually a comparison of forking with no dig. So the forking is putting a garden fork in the soil to its full length around 20 five centimeters, 10 inches, and just leavening, loosening, aerating, like broad forking. And what I'm noticing generally is that plants are not quite so healthy and happy from that. And here, the, this yellowing of the leaf, and I, I don't actually know what it is, or you know, if there's a technical term for it. It's not a virus, because if it was a virus, it would be on these plants. These, this is the same seed, the same plants put in, by me on the same day at the same time. You know, it's like there's no other differences, except that this soil that these two plants are growing in has been forked <coughs> um, about a week before they went in. And this is no dig, no soil disturbance, and the same compost on the surface of each bed. You know, there's just no other variables except the forking. So it must be doing something to interrupt, I think, the nutrient supply, maybe by breaking the fungal networks in the soil, which, symbiotically team up with plant roots to help them find nutrients and moisture. Something to do with that. And uh, you can see a little bit the same on the beans. It's not a huge difference. And if you looked at the beans on the fork bed, <coughs> you'd think, well, they look right. But then you compare them to the no dig, no disturbance, and those beans just look a little bit stronger. So these, I call them trials. That you know, It's not a scientific trial here, just to be <laughs> clear on that one. Uh, but they're just indications, comparisons, and, and you, you know, you could do similar things in your garden to, to just to find things out. And you, you learn by watching how plants grow, what's going on in soil and everything, and what might be causing the problems that you're seeing. If you were seeing that, then you're used to forking the ground, then maybe that's all it is. Just stop, you know, go no dig. It might solve a few problems. And it, it's not only about soil and, and nutrients. Oh, I just mentioned too, actually, um, the wood chips here on the theme of where we were before. And you can see in the path here, I've got wood chips on top. And it, not a lot. I just put on a scattering, really, uh, you know, an inch at the most, once a year. And as I go down, you can see there's nice dark soil below. They're just slowly breaking down into nice soil. And on the surface like this, they're not interfering with nutrient supply, but I don't want to use too many. Um, partly because also that might encourage build up of slugs and it just doesn't need a lot actually. Um, a light scattering like that is feeding soil life. And we'll have a look now at some plants that are struggling a bit with feeding, uh, but for a different reason again. Here's 
Yeah, there's a, a bit of a tale of beans and uh, some of them are not looking brilliant and some are. So why? Well, there may be two factors here, but one is actually cold. Uh, we've had a, a very cool spell of weather in the last three weeks. The, the first part of June here has been unusually cool, uh, often quite wet as well and dull, so lack of sunlight. And as it so happens that these plants went in on about the 1st of June, right at the beginning of that spell, they're French beans, dwarf French beans, and they, they need warmth to photosynthesize. They, if the soil temperature is not high enough, something like 20 centigrade, almost 70 Fahrenheit, they just physically can't work to get the food they need for growth. That's why it's just a waste of time to sow them too early in the spring. Ironically though, I've got some up there which I did sow earlier and I feel a bit bad about that actually because I'm always saying to people don't sow them too early but it just so happened. I did it, you know, because I'm always trying things out and um, they were sown actually on April the 15th and planted on roughly May the 15th and they caught a lovely warm spell that we had towards the end of May and it just got them going and you know it's a bit of a fluke and I wouldn't recommend trying that again. It, it, but it shows how luck plays a part sometimes as well in, in you know, getting a good crop. But generally speaking with French beans, and actually in the middle there's also soybeans, which I'm growing for edamame. And they seem to have a slightly greater resistance to cold and ability to grow in slightly cooler conditions than the French beans even, which surprised me. Uh, but you can see they're looking pretty green and healthy. And just to complete the bean story behind me is broad beans. And that the bean word is so misleading, I think, because it, it's applied to such a range of plants that are not really the same at all in terms of how they grow particularly. And broad beans tolerate a lot of cold. So, I mean, those beans actually, I sowed them last November and they've been in the ground right through the winter. And you can see how they're fruiting now, all ready to pick, basically, uh, compared to the French beans and the same with pole beans, runner beans, all of those. They're, those are warmth loving summer plants. So just be clear on those differences. Here we have a difference to do with variety. Um, it's not quite the same as the bean difference that we were talking about, broad bean, French bean. This is actually celery here, which I sowed on the 12th of March. Now it's the 23rd of June today, so that's three and a half months nearly. It's not far off being ready for harvest, but there's two varieties, Loretta, and Victoria and it just so happens I'd not grown Loretta before <coughs> and I didn't know that it would be as pale as this actually looking almost a little bit anemic with its yellowness but it's one of these golden self-blanching types of celery that you don't need to earth up or anything and you get nice pale sticks of celery so that's the difference. You know, if you'd only grown Loretta and it was looking yellow like this, you might be thinking, hmm, is there a nutrient shortage in my soil or whatever it might be? But it, no, it's just the, the varietal trait compared to the much greener Victoria. Uh, they're, they're both good, I would say, from what I'm seeing. There's one other thing going on here, which is a problem, if you like, and that is the leaves a little bit sort of curled inwards and um, look, just looking a bit, not, not fully happy somehow um, and I think it's aphids which <coughs> are common in spring um, particularly in spring because they need to arrive before the their predators can establish you know if you've got the predators first well the predators will just die because they haven't got enough food so you've got to go through a phase of having some ladybirds before the ladybirds in this case I'm seeing quite a few here and the ladybird larvae and so that I've, I'm, I'm not worried about the aphids, but they have, I think, caused a bit of damage. They're just sucking the sap. Uh, it looks like it's worse on the Loretta for some reason than on the Victoria. That's also a, a thing that happens. You know, some varieties are more susceptible than others. So um, also here I can show, you know, yellow leaf. That's classic lower leaves going yellow. That's nothing to worry about. That's just normal as plants grow and they age, the lower leaves go yellow. Generally I'll have to go through plants and remove them and I'll show you that on some calabrese here. 
the aphids, by the way, are come back to that later in the video because there's more to be said about aphids and whether or not you need to worry about them and what you can do. Here I just wanted to finish the section on yellow leaves by showing you this one. So we've got lovely calabrese, otherwise healthy plant and all it is is the lower leaves as they age they, they're no use to the plant anymore, the plant stops, they kind of stop working and they decay and go yellow. That's all it is. Um, it's nothing to worry about. You can see it on this leaf here as well, where that's earlier stage of going, getting old, basically. Old leaves go yellow, and um, but they start off just losing a bit of their nice fresh greenness. You know, if you compare that color to that one, say, you can see bits of purple coming in. It's not nutrient deficiency or anything at all. It's just a bit of old age sadly <laughs> and I, I actually remove leaves like this to the compost heap because if you let them finish going they'll go bright yellow and fall on the ground and then start to decay and that is food for slugs that's just how it works you know in nature so rather than let that happen because I don't want too many slugs here they can be quite a pest in our situation climate and everything so they're better off on the compost heap and there's another thing going on here which is these serrated leaves, that's pigeons, birds where they, pigeons, classic one, they love anything cabbagey, brassicky, brassica plants, and they leave the veins, and you can see how they sort of tunnel out the, the leaf bit in the middle. So if you see that happening, you know it's pigeons. The reason I haven't worried too much about this here with a cover, which I could do, I could put a net over and just keep them off, um, or a mesh, but because I've got a lot of calabrese actually and I've got as much as I need and so I can put up with a bit of pigeon damage and um, we're all coexisting happily for the moment. It's midsummer, things are growing strongly. If this was winter I'd be more worried because growth is not strong in the winter and that, then I would definitely do pigeon protection at that time of year because the plants can't recover from it very quickly whereas at the moment they just keep making new leaves and it's a bit the same story here actually where this is um, runner beans just trying to get at the stick. They struggle because of the cold, uh, which is why, again, some of the lower leaves or older leaves are looking a bit poor. Um, but again, not a worry. If you take that one out and look at the new growth, you can see it's fine. But what happened here, to be precise, and I was a bit worried when I saw it about two weeks ago, a rabbit, again, at the growing tip, the bit that was trying to shoot up the pole and um, I didn't do anything again because there's there's lots of beans here not that many rabbits I don't think <laughs> and, and I know that they're going to recover and that's what they're doing they're making new shoots coming out of the plant so these then as they get a bit longer I just guide them around a bit like that and they'll they'll race away now we're going to have a warm week we're forecast 25 centigrade 77 Fahrenheit so I think you know within a week these will just look so different so that's all, all good really and we could now move on to a, a very interesting thing happening over here about wheat growth that illustrates more points again to put the context of what's going on here this is um was my hotbed in the greenhouse it's, it was three months old and we moved it out here the the horse manure still warm but not hot put roughly six inches 15 centimeter of homemade compost on top and planted these mostly warmth loving plants into the compost and my idea is that the warmth from the still fermenting horse manure at the bottom warms the roots a bit and helps them to grow and you can see the results of doing this later in the season on a previous video I put up last autumn so <clears throat> what's happened here though since these were planted roughly three weeks ago we've had the cold weather of the first part of June this year and quite a bit of wind and because these are warmth loving plants they have not been happy and you can see from the the growth but I, I want to show you this because to reassure you a bit you know like this aubergine here for example it's called Ping Tung Long it's a Thai speciality aubergine I think probably it's quite used to Thailand weather <laughs> which is a lot hotter than here so the lower leaves are you know they are not looking good and in fact what I do when I see 
leaves like that, rather like I was showing you on the calabrese just now, is, is just take them off because they're, they're not helping the plant anymore. It's kind of nice for, as a gardener, you then, you suddenly see, well, actually the new growth is looking pretty good. And we can see it on some of these other plants too, like the pepper, you know, you take off these lower leaves, which, you know, have struggled because of the poor conditions and also a bit of transplant shock. These were quite big plants when they went in. And these are warmth loving plants, all of them, the pepper, the tomato and so on. And yeah, we have here now a pepper that is looking reasonable. So it's come through that. It's not nothing terminal, but it's had a period of bad weather. I did plan to put a cloche over these and I just never had time to get around to it. And that's why these hoops are here. We didn't use them in the end. And that, that would have helped, but there you go. Um, now I'm not gonna do any protection because we're now late June and the weather is warming up. So I, you know, I think we're gonna get a crop here. It may not be as big as last year. We won't, however, get a crop of melons. I mean, look at this, the poor old melon. It's just rotted on the stem at the base. And um, I put one around each corner and there's just one of the plants that looks as though it might do something. Um, but melons are very warmth loving plants. And so, you know, if these kinds of things happen, it might well be weather related. Basil likewise, it doesn't like having a lot of wet on its leaves and that can cause that kind of thing with brown spots. And so again, if you took those off, um, most of the new growth, still not all, it's only just warming up now. And you can see that's starting to look better already. <laughs> so this is just sweet Genovese basil. And by comparison with aubergines here, we've got a different variety called Slim Jim, which is a more cool tolerant aubergine variety. Take off one lower leaf and mostly pretty strong growth actually, that's good. Tomatoes, <coughs> Tomatoes put up with more cold than aubergines and peppers. So this one, it's called Prima Bella. It's also got some blight tolerance and it got a bit hammered by wind and conditions and it hasn't really got going. I'm gonna take that off. That first truss for me <clears throat> is taking too much energy from the only recently established and growing plant. I'm gonna grow it as a cordon plant, side shooting. And we've got a nice strong side shoot which will now become the main leader going up and I'll put in a stake for that. So quite a bit going on here, lots of stories to tell. And to finish on yellowing leaves, I want to just show you some different varieties of courgettes, some with yellow leaves and some not. These two courgette plants look so different. And if that was the only one in your garden, you might think, ah, what's wrong with my courgette? <laughs> These bright yellow leaves. And it's, it's a yellow courgette variety, that, that's, that's all it is. And they do have this yellowness on their leaves. And you can see the fruits there. Lovely yellow courgettes developing. In fact, there's one ready to pick. I re generally reckon to pick them when their little flowers start to go die and fall off. And by comparison here, we have a green courgette. So these plants were sown at exactly the same time in the same conditions. The, the only difference is yellow variety and a green variety and lovely fruits on both of them. And they taste, I reckon, quite similar actually. It's more the look and generally speaking that the size difference there reflects the how you tend to get less quantity of yellow courgette than you do of green ones. Um, but that's why I've grown, I do just one yellow and quite a few green. I prefer the green on the whole. And now in terms of problems. This isn't a problem, I'm pleased to say, but it, it's just to clarify. Um, and in some ways pests, I want to look a bit more at pests and we're going to have a look at aphids and to what extent they are a problem or maybe not so much as one might fear. Mm -hmm.